The words to which I should like to call your attention this morning are to be found in the Gospel according to St. John. In the first chapter, reading verses 26 and 33, and taking this in connection with what we read just now from the second chapter of the book of the Acts of the Apostles. John answered them, saying, I baptize with water, but there standeth one among you whom ye know not, and I knew him not. But he that sent me to baptize with water, the same said unto me, Upon whom thou shalt see the Spirit descending and remaining on him, the same is he which baptizeth with the Holy Ghost. And that, I say, we must take this morning in connection with the account given there in the second chapter of the book of the Acts of the Apostles of that amazing thing that happened on the day of Pentecost at Jerusalem. Now, today is Whit Sunday, and it is the anniversary of that day of Pentecost. We are therefore considering an event which belongs to history. This is as much a part of the history as uh, was the birth of our Lord in Bethlehem. As much of history as his miracles, his death upon the cross, as historical uh, happening and event as his literal physical resurrection in the body out of the grave as literal a fact of history as his ascension, recorded in the first chapter of this book of the Acts of the Apostles. We therefore are commemorating, as I say, something that belongs solidly to the realm of history. I'm emphasizing this because this is something that perhaps needs to be emphasized more than ever at this present time. We must never lose sight of the fact that our gospel and our salvation is not a mere teaching, not a mere philosophy. It is primarily a series of acts, of actions, of happenings, events, and the meaning and the purpose of those events. So we on these occasions always remind ourselves of the historicity of that which we are considering. In other words, what we read here in this second chapter of Acts is something that literally happened in the way that it is described. Luke was primarily an historian, and his concern was to give to this man Theophilus, to whom he'd already written his gospel, a further account of the continuing action and activity of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so he's dealing here with something that belongs solidly and purely to the realm of history. Now then, what was it that happened? Well, what happened was, as the records make so plain and clear, that the early church was baptized with the Holy Ghost. You remember the promises with respect to that in the Old Testament. You remember how it was the great theme, as we've been reminded from the two verses in uh, the first chapter of the Gospel according to St. John, it was the great theme, in a sense, of the preaching of John the Baptist. I am not the Christ. I baptize with water. There's another. You don't know him. There was a time when I didn't know him. But the one who sent me to baptize, in other words, God, who called me and gave me my commission, he said to me, the one on whom you shall see the Holy Ghost descending and remaining upon him, He is the one who shall baptize with the Holy Ghost. And our Lord himself repeats the same thing and tells these people to stay in Jerusalem, not to go out and start upon their work to which he's already commissioned them, but wait until they shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost. And here in this chapter we read, of that thing which had thus been prophesied so much, literally and actually taking place. Well, now the question for us is, what is the relevance of all this to us? What are we doing exactly? Is this uh, merely a commemoration of something that once happened? 
Are we just looking back at a fair great fact in history? Is it just that? Or is there more than that to it? Has it a greater and a deeper significance for us? Is this what we are doing, I say, a purely commemorative act? Or is there another factor, something that goes beyond that? Well, now, the answer to that question is determined entirely by our attitude to the doctrine concerning the baptism with the Holy Spirit. This is a most crucial matter. Those who attend here regularly will know how crucial we regard it. We've been dealing with this now for many months because we regard it as the most urgent, vital, and crucial matter for the Christian Church at the present time. And it is, unfortunately, it has become, unfortunately, a point of division with respect to the whole doctrine of the Holy Spirit and his work. Now, people who are evangelical in their outlook are agreed with, agreed with one another about practically everything in connection with the doctrine of the person and the work of the Holy Spirit apart from this one matter. They're agreed about his activity in the creation. They're agreed in his position in the blessed Holy Trinity. They're agreed with his operations upon certain men, giving them gifts to perform certain tasks, as you see it described in the Old Testament. The prophets, certain men working in the temple like Bezalel, and so on. They're agreed about all that. They're agreed in his activity in connection with the Lord Jesus Christ himself. How he came upon him and enabled him to preach and to do his work while he was here in this world. They agree about his activity in his death and in his resurrection. They're agreed about the work of the Holy Spirit in convicting people of sin. They're agreed about his operation in the great and mighty act of regeneration. They're agreed more or less in general also about his activity in sanctification. There is a slight difference there. But the point I'm establishing is that in almost the entire range of the details of the great doctrine of the Spirit and his work, there is agreement. But when you come to this matter of the baptism with the Holy Spirit, there is a divergence and a disagreement. And it is, as I say, because to me this is a most vital matter, a crucial matter, that I am calling your attention to it this morning. What is the significance of what happened on the day of Pentecost to us? Now, there are in the main two views with regard to this. We needn't be bothered about minor deviations here and there, or minor differences it comes to this, that there are two major points of view. And I want to put the two before you in order that you may see the vital importance of this doctrine. Now, the first is the view that uh, teaches that uh, what really happened on the day of Pentecost at Jerusalem was that the church, the Christian church, was born. The Christian church came into being. The Christian church was constituted and formed as the body of Christ. They have to admit, most of them, some you don't even admit that, but most of them are ready to admit that these disciples were already regenerate, already born again. But they're owing to the special, peculiar circumstances that obtained then and then only. They couldn't be baptized with the Spirit until the day of Pentecost. So they're ready to admit that there was an interval in the case of the disciples between their regeneration and their being baptized with the Spirit. But they say that was solely due to the fact that uh, there was an order in these matters, an almost dispensational order, and the order had to be observed. So in their case, there was this interval. But here on the day of Pentecost, 
they were all of them baptized with the Holy Ghost, which means that they were baptized into the body of Christ. The church was formed. A unity came into being that was not there before. And so the church as an organism, as a body, comes into being and is given the power to do the work to which he has been sent. And, of course, it follows from that that they say with regard to this event that it was a once and for all event. It could only happen once. It did, they say, only happen once. Never to be repeated. So it is an event in and of itself, and all we can do is to look back to this unique once and for all event. Then they go on to say, there is a good deal of confusion in what they do say, but I'm trying to give you the, uh, what I would regard as the commonest view. They would say that since then, and especially since what happened in the household of Cornelius, as is recorded in the 10th chapter of this book of the Acts of the Apostles, the baptism with the Holy Ghost happens to everybody at regeneration. When a man is regenerated, he is at the same time baptized by the Spirit into the body of Christ and becomes a part of this one body that was formed on the day of Pentecost. I say, especially since what happened in the household of Cornelius for this reason, that, of course, they are in difficulties over the people in Samaria, the account of which is given in Acts 8, and even the case of the Apostle Paul. But they say, in the case of the household of Cornelius, while Peter was yet speaking, the Spirit fell. Obviously, regeneration and the baptism of the Spirit happened at one and the same time. They have to gloss over the case of the Ephesians, as recorded in Acts 19, verses 1 to 7. But in general, they say, now this has become the norm. Obviously, the case of the disciples was a unique one and a special one. But now, ever since, the baptism with the Holy Ghost is an event which is synchronous with and practically identical with regeneration. And it means that all who are Christians are already baptized with the Holy Ghost and have become part and parcel of the body of Christ. So that the regenerate person is one who has received the baptism. He has received the Holy Spirit. He has received all that it is possible for a Christian to receive. All he has to do, therefore, they say, is this, is to go on living and walking in the Spirit. He has been baptized with the Spirit, he's been filled with the Spirit. All he has to do is to maintain that. He mustn't expect anything further. He mustn't seek anything further. He mustn't long for anything further. He has received this baptism and all that it connotes there at the point of his regeneration. Now they say it is possible, of course, and unless for the Christian who thus has been baptized with the Spirit and filled with the Spirit, it is possible for him to fall away from that. He may fall into sin. He may become slack. He may backslide. And as he does so, he will lose this blessing. He grieves the Spirit. He quenches the Spirit. He may offend the Spirit in this way. The Spirit doesn't leave him. The Spirit is still there in him. But he has grieved the Spirit. So he is not now experiencing the gracious influences of the Spirit. What is he to do? Well, they say all that is necessary is this. He's got to realize this. He's got to repent of it. He's got to surrender himself once more. And he's got to go on living a life of obedience to the spirit that is in him. And if he does this, what he has lost will be restored unto him. And he will be able to go on his way rejoicing and happy. Now, this is, this is what has been the prevailing and the most popular and common evangelical teaching with regard to the meaning of the baptism with the Holy Ghost. The day of Pentecost, that's quite on its own, it's unique, it's separate, never to be repeated, obviously. And uh, the Christian now is in this position. 
He has everything that can be desired and it all depends now upon his yielding, his obedience, his walking in the Spirit, his allowing the Spirit to dominate his life. Now there is a, a most important and interesting corollary to this teaching. And it's the one I want to emphasize this morning. Such a teaching rarely, if ever at all, speaks about revival. It's not interested in revival. And of course it obviously cannot be. There is no room left for revival in that teaching. Every Christian has been baptized with the Spirit at the point of regeneration, has had the fullness of the Spirit. Well, there's nothing more that he can receive. It is future now, and the future of the church depends entirely upon his obedience, his yielding to the Spirit who remains in him in spite of his rebellion and disobedience. There is no room left whatsoever for revival. And it's very interesting to notice that the people who teach this view of the baptism of the Holy Spirit never mention it. I've made a practice now for many years, whenever I see a book on the doctrine of the Holy Spirit, which I've never seen before, the first thing I do is to look at the index. I look either at the synopsis or the table of contents at the beginning and the index at the end. I look for revival. And I don't find it. Now, I commend that to you as an interesting exercise. Look at the books on the person and the work of the Holy Spirit that have been published during this century. And look for a section, a chapter or even a part of a chapter, on the subject of revival. And you will not find it. It's not there. And of course, they're perfectly consistent. It's been excluded. There is no possibility. There's no room left for it. It can't happen. And so, you find that this is the interesting corollary of this particular view of uh, the doctrine of the baptism with the Holy Ghost. And the result is that the activity of the church the way in which the church has conducted herself and her outlook during this present century has been this. When uh, things are not going too well, well, the church doesn't uh, exhort uh, the people to pray for revival. She uh, decides to have an evangelistic campaign. She organizes a campaign. And then, of course, asks God to bless that. But the solution is an organized evangelistic campaign. And this has become the kind of pattern I think you'll all agree. People are converted in meetings, campaigns, evangelistic efforts. And there it is believed that if they believe and respond, they are born again and they are baptized with the Spirit. And all they need now is a further teaching which will tell them to go on yielding, to go on surrendering, to go on giving obedience, to go on allowing the Spirit who has come into them in his fullness to possess them whole. And that is the sum of evangelical teaching. Conversion, regeneration, this further teaching with regard to sanctification. And you notice that the whole time the emphasis is placed upon what we do. It's all in our hands. There's nothing further to be expected. It all is a matter now of our surrendering and our obedience. And so the whole of the effort is put on that. Pressure is brought on the will, both in the first decision and in the subsequent surrender. Here it is. You and I alone determine what is going to happen. Now there is one view. But there is another view. And the other, of course, is the old evangelical view. I call it that because I'm speaking strictly historically. The view I've been dealing with is still not fully a hundred years old. But prior to that, and even continuing since, there is this other view. The view that has obtained in the church throughout the centuries. What is it? Well, let me put it like this to you. 
What happened at Pentecost, according to this second teaching, is this. That the church was baptized with the Holy Ghost, as our Lord had promised and as the others had prophesied. What does it mean? Well, what it means is a baptism of power. The church was already full. Now, we were dealing with this last Sunday. I just want you to see the sequence, that you may have it clearly in your mind. These men were regenerate. Our Lord says to them, Now are ye clean through the word that I have spoken unto you, I pray for these, not for the world, and many other statements in the Gospels. Right? They were all regenerate. Then, after his resurrection, when he appears to them in the upper room, he forms the church, he incorporates them, he breathes the Spirit upon them, saying to them, Receive ye the Holy Ghost. Not what he said later, uh, where he says, You shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost not many days hence. No, but as I was able to demonstrate to you last Sunday, he used an expression which meant that they were to receive it at that time, and they did. And the church was formed there, and he gives it the authority to remit sins, and so on. Very well, here is the church form. Now then, on the day of Pentecost, what happens is that the Lord sends upon the church this power to witness that he had promised. You shall receive power. That's what happened at Pentecost. There's nothing here about the constitution or the formation of the church. No, no, that's already happened. What he says is, you shall receive power. And on the day of Pentecost, in the baptism of the Holy Ghost, the church received the power. We see her before that waiting in accordance with his command, waiting constantly and instantly in prayer. And then suddenly on this day of Pentecost, this tremendous thing happened. There they were met together in this one place. Suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind and it filled all the house where they were sitting, and so on. Now, this was a baptism with power and a baptism with fire, with fire. And the thing you notice that is emphasized is this. Not uh, some secret operation of the Spirit in the depths of the personality, but the Spirit falling upon the gathered church, descending upon them being poured out upon her. Those are the terms that are used, and that is exactly what happened. The very sound of the rushing mighty wind emphasizes this objectivity, this givenness. It isn't a, a secret work such as happens in regeneration. No, no, it's a power coming upon the church, something happening to the assembled company. And she finds herself filled with power and authority, with certainty and with a sense of glory. It is the action of the risen Lord. God had told John the Baptist, it is upon the one whom you will see the Holy Ghost descending upon and remaining. That's the one that's going to do this. And he is the one that did it. He said he was going to do it, and he did it. What happened, therefore, on the day of Pentecost was that upon the formed early church there descends the power for ministry, the power for witness. Now then, I must ask the question that I asked into the first section. Is this therefore something once and for all? And the answer is this. It is once and for all in one sense only. And that is that it was the first time it ever happened. But it is not once and for all in any other sense, as I'm now going to try to prove to you. A thing that happens for the first time, well, you can't go on repeating the first time, but you can repeat what happened on the first time. It is only once and for all in the sense that it was the first time. I first entered this pulpit on the last Sunday morning of the year 1935. Well, I can't repeat that, but I have, I have repeated the action. I've repeated the action how many hundreds of times since? I can't repeat the very first time I came here, but I do exactly the same thing. Now, it's only once and for all in that sense that it was the first time it happened. 
but it is not once and for all in any other sense. How do we demonstrate this? Well, we do so like this. What we are told about the, those people there on the day of Pentecost was that they were all filled with the Holy Ghost. That's the term that's used. There appeared unto them cloven tongues like as a fire, and it sat upon each of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak with other tongues and all the rest that followed. But now, if you go to the fourth chapter of this same book of Acts, you will find that incident where Peter and John were arrested as the result of their performing of the miracle and the men who sat at the beautiful gate of the temple. And uh, they were put on trial and the authorities decided that they would let them off this time. But they straightly charged them that they should do nothing further in the name of this Jesus. They called them and commanded them not to speak at all nor teach in the name of Jesus. So when they had further threatened them, they let them go, finding nothing how they might punish them because of the people. And then you remember Peter and John went back to the company, to the church, and reported what had happened to them. And when the church heard this, they lifted up their voice to God with one accord, and they began to pray. And what they prayed for, of course, was that God might uh, behold their con the threatenings of these people. And now, Lord, behold their threatenings, and grant unto thy servants that with all boldness they may speak thy word by stretching forth thine hand to heal, and that signs and wonders may be done by the name of thy holy child Jesus. Listen. And when they had prayed, the place was shaken where they were assembled together, and they were all filled with the Holy Ghost, and they spake the word of God with boldness. Exactly the same thing as had happened on the day of Pentecost. An exact repetition. The same people. And you notice the objectivity again. The place was shaken. It's something happening outside them. They are not here just yielding. The, they had no, no need to. They hadn't been disobedient. They'd been very obedient. They'd borne a wonderful witness before these authorities and powers. They'd said to them without any hesitation, uh, whether it be right in the sight of God to hearken unto you more than unto God, judge ye. For we cannot but speak of the things we have seen and heard. They'd witnessed with boldness, and yet they see here they need something further. And they pray, and God answers and the place is shaken, the Spirit descends upon them. The shaking of the building corresponds to the sound of the mighty rushing wind, and they're all filled with the Spirit. And the same result follows, that they spake the word of God with boldness, and later with great power gave the apostles witness of the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and great grace was upon them all. It's an exact repetition of what happened on the day of Pentecost. And then, I mustn't keep you this morning, we've been over this evidence, but I'd ask you again to read for yourselves the account of what happened in Samaria in chapter 8. Read what happened in the household of Cornelius in chapter 10, while Peter was yet speaking. While Peter yet spake these words, the Holy Ghost fell on all them which had heard the word. We are not told that some secret action took place in their souls leading to regeneration. That did happen, of course. But in addition, the Holy Ghost fell on them. And they of the circumcision which believed were astonished as many as came with Peter, because that on the Gentiles also was poured out the gift of the Holy Ghost. And you remember Peter's argument. He says, Can any man forbid water that these should not be baptized? which have received the Holy Ghost as well as we? How did he know that? Well, they heard them speak with tongues and magnify God. Exactly the same thing had happened to them as had happened to the apostles and the others on the day of Pentecost. This is a repetition. And on and on I could take you through the evidence once more. Now, there is the evidence as we have it in the book of the Acts of the Apostles. But look at history. And this is where the whole matter becomes, to me, so crucial and so vital. The history of the church. What is the history of the church? 
Well, you know the graph of the history of the church is something like this. She starts up there on the day of Pentecost. After a while, she seems to have lost much of her power and becomes more or less ineffective. Then she rises again in power. It goes on. Down it goes again. Up it goes. That's the graph of the history of the church. Read your church history for yourselves. How do you explain this? Well, this is what has happened. The church has become worldly. The church has forgotten her true nature and has forgotten her commission. The church has absorbed a lot of Greek philosophy and a lot of Roman law. People like Constantine decide politically to bring the empire into the church because it's going to help him and pay him in certain respects. And the church becomes an institution. But what happens? Well, what happens has been something like this. Certain men become concerned and disturbed and unhappy. And they say what we need is another baptism with this Holy Ghost. We must seek the face of God. They did everything they could. They repented. They rendered obedience. They tried to go on walking in the life of faith, a life of surrender to the Spirit. And they did so genuinely. But nothing happened. And they went on and on like that and were almost at the point of despair when suddenly something happened. Often when they least expected it. When they were on the verge of utter despair. Suddenly upon an assembled company the Holy Spirit falls again. Oh, it's simply wonderful to read the accounts of these events. Sometimes they've described actually hearing a sound, as if there were another rushing mighty wind. Not always, but what does happen in, invariably is that they're aware of a presence and of a power. Something's come upon them and has happened to them, and they're lifted up out of themselves and out of time. They scarcely know where they are, and phenomena take place. No, I'm not talking about speaking with tongues. What I'm talking about is joy and abandon, sometimes so great that people even faint and cling into unconsciousness, and great power and great liberty, a great authority follows in preaching. And that is what is called a revival. Now, this is what has been happening in the church throughout the running centuries. And the thing that I'm emphasizing, of course, is this, that it is always the action of God. It isn't men. Men's done everything. He's been surrendering. He's been obedient. He's done everything, but nothing happens. He may organize all nights of prayer, and every night nothing happens. And then suddenly something does happen. And nobody understands and nobody can explain it. There is only one explanation. It is God again. It is the one who sent the Holy Ghost on the early church. It is the one who sent it on that building and shook the walls. It's the God who did it then, who's repeating it and who's gone on repeating it throughout the running centuries. My dear friends, if you read the history of the church, you can come to only one conclusion. This has been God's way of keeping the church alive. The Christian church would have been dead and finished centuries ago and many times over were it not for revivals. This is the true meaning of the word revival. It is God pouring out his spirit on an assembled church or company or many churches or countries even at a time. This has been God's way of preserving the church. What he did at the beginning, he has done again. When the life was gone, he sent it again. When the power has vanished, he sent it again. That has been the history of the Christian church from the first century until today. Now let me just refresh your memories by reminding you of some of the examples of this. You know, there was something like this in the second century. The church had been absorbing Greek philosophy. And uh, she was so anxious to show that there was nothing strange about her doctrine. These apologists who held sway in the second century were governed by that idea. And the result was the church had become lifeless. She'd lost her power. Certain people were aware of this. 
And they began to seek the face of God, and God answered. I'm referring to what is called Montanism. I know there were excesses. I know that they went wrong at certain points. But at any rate, the church was alive again, and there was power in the church. And one of the greatest intellects and brains of the whole history of the church, Tertullian, entered into this movement when he saw that that was New Testament as over and against the formal dead church. You had another example of it in North Africa in the third century, the Donatist movement. Same thing, a rebellion against formality, the formality that had come in when Constantine and the Roman Empire came into Christianity. It was denounced, of course. The, the church always denounces every revival. The Montanists and the Donatists were both condemned by the church as the Methodists were condemned 200 years ago. And as people who are filled with the Spirit are almost invariably condemned by a dead formal church. And then you get in the Middle Ages, here and there amongst odd people, God visits them and blesses them. There were revivals in the south of France in the Middle Ages, revivals in connection with the Waldensian church in northern Italy, Revivals amongst the brethren of the common life in Germany and parts of Holland. All this prior to the Reformation, then the Great Reformation itself. Undoubtedly was a revival. Men like Hugh Latimer, who used to preach at St. Paul's Cross, was a man clearly filled with the Spirit and preached in an apostolic manner. And there were others. Then, in the 17th century, there were remarkable movements, local revivals in Northern Ireland and in parts of Scotland. I've reminded you already of that tremendous thing that happened at Kirk or Schatz when John Livingston was preaching and just preached that one sermon which led to the conversion of so many. The Spirit came down upon them. A repetition of Pentecost. And of course everybody knows about the 18th century in the United States and in this country. That revival that broke out in Northampton under the ministry of Jonathan Edwards. That soaring genius. Read his account of it. He wrote a narrative, an account of that revival. Read it, my friends, and then you'll know what a revival is. It's the Spirit coming upon him. Not men controlling and just deciding to yield and to give obedience. No, no. People have done that and still nothing happened. Then God does something. God sends down his spirit. God visits them. That's revival. And, of course, exactly the same happened in this country. Under the ministry of Whitfield and the Wesleyans. It happened in Wales under Daniel Rowland, Howell Harris. And in each case... Keep your eye on the objectivity. How uh, suddenly, when nobody was expecting it, Daniel Rowland, for instance, had been in trouble for months. He'd believed the truth at last. He'd been in the ministry without believing it, but now he sees it. And he was trying to preach justification by faith. And still he said he didn't feel it. But there he was one Sunday morning in a communion church service in his little church and actually reading the liturgy in connection with the communion service. And he came to the words about Christ's precious blood. He was actually reading it out of the book. As he was reading it, the Holy Ghost fell upon him and upon the church. He wept, he broke down. A revival broke out. That was in 1735. And it continued for a number of years. Then there was a lull from about 1750 to 1762. He was still a great preacher and still occasional converts, but there was no life and power such as they'd known. But at the end of 1762, and still more in 1763, God again sent a great baptism upon them. Oh, time would fail me to tell you of these things. But look at last century, the 19th century. Have you ever read of the great revival in the United States which began in 1857 and went on to 1859? Have you read of that little prayer meeting that a men began in Fulton Street in New York City? And they went on praying for months and nothing happened. They did all the surrendering that they were capable of. Nothing happened. But then it did happen. God. It's always God. It's always pouring forth. It's always shedding abroad. It's always falling upon. 
And that was one of the greatest revivals in the whole history of the Christian church. But it wasn't confined. began in Ulster in 1858, began in Wales in 1859, and went right through the country. Amazing, astonishing. You can read these accounts for yourselves. You won't get them in books, as I say, written on the Holy Spirit in the 20th century. But you read the books of the 19th century, in the 18th, and you'll find they're there. And buy a book like that of Sprague on the history of revivals. And then in 1904 and 5, same thing again in Wales. 1906 in Korea, still more recently, within the last 12 years in the Congo. Several revivals have happened in the island of Lewis, not only the one connect, connected with the name of the Reverend Duncan Campbell, but before that, revivals. This has been the story of the Christian church throughout the running centuries. And all this I am suggesting to you is a repetition of Pentecost. The church waiting, God sending down his spirit upon the church. Now, you see the importance of this doctrine of the baptism with the Holy Ghost. It is this second teaching alone that holds out any hope for us this morning. Here's the lesson for us. What is the church to do? Well, of course, she should go on yielding and obeying. She should do all that. But, oh, if we had to stop at that, I would despair. I'd be without hope. I know men, I know individual ministers who have been teaching this for 20 years and more, trying to get their people to do it, persuading their people to do it. They've obeyed, they've sacrificed, they've surrendered, they've had special prayer meetings every morning at 7 o'clock. It's been going on for years. But nothing has happened so far. And you see, if it all depends upon us, what hope is there? But the message of the day of Pentecost is this. That what God has done, God can still do. This is something that God has gone on repeating throughout the running centuries. And what the church needs to do is to realize her weakness, her impotence. That the power is always of God and not of man. There is nothing so fatal as the reliance upon man's ability to deal with the situation of the church. The first step is to realize that men having done everything has in a sense done nothing. Oh yes, he can produce a number of converts. Thank God for that. And that goes on regularly in evangelical churches every Sunday. But the need today is much too great for that. The need today is for an authentication of God, of the supernatural, of the spiritual, of the eternal. And this can only be answered by God graciously hearing our cry and shedding forth again his spirit upon us and filling us as he kept on filling the early church. Here are men filled on the day of Pentecost, again a day or two later, the building shaken, and the filling again, and God has gone on filling the church in revival. That is, I say, the greatest need, and that is our only hope this morning. But you see, you've got to believe in the possibility of that. If your doctrine of the Holy Spirit doesn't leave any room for revival, well, then you can't expect this kind of thing. If you say the baptism of the Spirit was once and for all on Pentecost and all who were regenerated are just made partakers of that, there's no room left for this objective coming, this repetition, this falling of the Holy Ghost in power and authority upon a church. There's no room left. But thank God there is room left. The teaching of the Scripture plus the long history of the Christian church shows this so clearly and that you and I are called upon this morning not only to believe this, but to pray to God without ceasing for it. To ask him to open the windows of heaven and to send down the Spirit to pour him upon us that he may fall upon us in mighty power. And here is to me the great encouragement. I've told you how 
in Fulton Street in New York. Just one man began to pray at first, and then two or three joined him. And then more and more came until they had to move to a bigger building, and they went on praying for months, and God answered. The story in Northern Ireland was this. There was a very simple laborer, working man, called James McWilkin. He began to pray alone. Then he persuaded a friend of his to join him, just two men, and they prayed in a little schoolroom for months, just the two of them. But then others began to pray, and on and on they went, and at last God heard and answered. And so it has been. There has always been this preliminary period when just one man or two men or a group of men, realizing the truth of this doctrine, have turned to God and have started pleading and play, praying urgently and without ceasing. And then, suddenly, in a prayer meeting, perhaps, or in a preaching service, or anywhere, God suddenly sends down the Spirit. He comes again. Sometimes he comes almost again as a mighty rushing wind. I don't know that I've reminded you before, but if you like to read the autobiography of Dr. Andrew Murray of South Africa, you will read there his account of a revival in one of the churches where he ministered. He was presiding at a prayer meeting, and he says that he literally heard a noise a sound, a kind of rumbling, and it came nearer and nearer. It was the outbreak of the revival in that church. But there isn't always the noise. But there is always the sense of glory. There is always the sense of awe, the sense of the majesty of God. There is always a sense of power. There is always an assurance of salvation. It always leads to great joy. And it always gives boldness in witness, whether from a pulpit or in private. It always gives a convicting and a converting power. What happens always is that the believers are revived Revival can only happen to a man who's got life. It means revivifying. The church has lost her power. She's given the power again. He gave the power at the beginning. He goes on repeating, giving the power. That's revival. And God has kept his church alive and going by this succession of revivals throughout the running century. To me, as I said at the very beginning, to me there is nothing that is more urgently important than this. Do you believe in revival, my friend? Are you praying for revival? What are you trusting? Are you trusting the organizing power of the church? Or are you trusting in the power of God to pour out his spirit upon us again, to revive us, to baptize us anew, and afresh with his most blessed Holy Spirit. The church needs another Pentecost. Every revival is a repetition of Pentecost. And it is the greatest need of the Christian church at this present hour. Oh, may God open the eyes of our understanding on this vital matter that we may look to him and wait upon him until in his infinite mercy and compassion he sends down from on high once more the power of the Holy Ghost upon us. Amen. We do hope that you've been helped by the preaching of Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones. All of the sermons contained within the MLJ Trust audio library are now available for free download. You may share the sermons or broadcast them. However, because of international copyright, please be advised that we are asking first that these sermons never be offered for sale by a third party. And second, that these sermons will not be edited in any way for length or to use as audio clips. 
You can find our contact information on our website at mljtrust.org. That's mljtrust.org.